After the huge losses sustained in the Battle of the Gullet, there were only two men on Dragonstone that night in the aftermath who drank to the slaughter in a smoky tavern beneath the castle walls, while most in the keep were grieving their losses. The dragon riders, Hugh the Hammer and Ulf the White, who had flown Vermithor and Silverwing into the battle and lived to boast of it. We are knights now truly, Hard Hugh declared, and Ulf laughed and said, We should be lords. The other dragon seed, the small brown skinned girl Nettles, did not share their celebrations. She had flown with the others and fought as bravely, but her face was black with smoke and streaked with tears when she returned to Dragonstone. Battle had taken the toll on the young girl. Adam Valarian, lately Adam of Hull, sought out the sea snake, called it Valarian after the battle. What they spoke of to each other is not known. Even the full mushroom, who seemingly hears every word uttered on Dragonstone, has no comment on the words that pass between them. Two weeks later, over in the Reach, Ormond Hightower of the Greens found himself caught between two armies. Thaddeus Rowan, Lord of Golden Grove, and Tom Flowers, bastard of the Britter Bridge, who were bearing down on him from the northeast with a great host of mounted knights, while Sir Alan Beesbury and Lord Alan Tarley, as well as Lord Owen Costain, had joined their power to cut off his retreat to Old Town, when their hosts closed around him on the banks of the River Honeywine, attacking front and rear at once. Lord Hightower saw his lines crumble. Defeat seemed imminent and certain. That is until a shadow swept across the battlefield and a terrible roar resounded overhead. Slicing through the sound of steel on steel, a dragon had come. Lord Hightower's plea for help had been answered, albeit late. The dragon Tessarian, the Blue Queen, Cobalt and Copper, had come. On her back rode the youngest of Queen Alicent's three sons, Daron Targaryen, 15 years of age, the same gentle and soft spoken lad who had once been a milk brother to Prince Shikaris who himself was floating in the depths of the narrow sea. The arrival of Prince Daron and his dragon reversed the tide of the battle with immediate effect. Now it was Lord Ormond's men attacking, screaming curses at their foes, whilst Rhaenyra's men fled. By the end of that long bloody day, Lord Rowan was retreating north, the small remnants of his host. Tom Flowers lay dead and burned amongst the grass. The two Allens were taken captive, and Lord Costain was dying from his wounds. As wolves and ravens fed upon their bodies of the slain, Ormond Hightower beasted Prince Daron on Oryx and Strongwine and dubbed him a knight with the storied Valerian steel sword, Villigence, naming him Sir Daron the Daring for his fearless attack on the blacks. The prince modestly replied, My lord, it's kind to say so, but the victory belonged to Sarian, not me. On Dragonstone, air of despondence and defeat hung over the black court like a heavy cloud when the disaster of the Honeywine became known. Defeat had followed defeat as wives and mothers across the realm wept in their grief. Lord Bar Emin went so far as to suggest that maybe the time had come to bend their knees to Aegon. He was the only lord to suggest this, but not the only lord to have thought it. The queen would have none of it. Only the gods truly know the heart of men, and women are full of strangers. Broken by the loss of one son, Lucerys, Rhaenyra Targaryen seemed to find new strength, but after the loss of a second, many feared for her resolve. Jace's death hardened her, burning away her fears, leaving only anger and hatred for her half-brother. Still possessed of more dragons than Aegon, who himself had not been seen publicly since the Battle of Rook's Rest, her grace now resolved to use her dragons. No matter the cost, she would rain down fire and death upon Aegon and all those who support him, she told the Black Council, and either tear him from the Iron Throne or die in the attempt. But a similar resolve had taken root across Blackwater Bay in the heart of Aemon Targaryen, ruling in his brother's name as Lord Protector, whilst Aegon lay abed healing from his horrific burns sustained in the Battle of Rook's Rest. Contentious of his half-sister, Aemon One-Eye saw a greater threat in his uncle, Prince Daemon, a proven battle commander, and with a great host he had gathered at Harrenhal. Summoning his bannermen and council, the prince announced his intent to bring battle to his uncle and chastise the rebellious riverlords. He proposed to strike the riverlands from both east and west, and thus forced the lords of the trident to fight on two fronts at once. Jason Lannister had assembled a formidable host in the Westerlands, a thousand armoured knights, seven times as many archers and men-at-arms, thus descend from high ground and cross the Red Fork with fire and sword, while Sir Christian Cole marched forth from King's Landing, accompanied by Aemond himself on Vagar. The two armies would converge on Harrenhal to crush the traitors and the trident between them, and if his uncle emerged from behind the castle walls to oppose them, as he surely must, Vagar would overcome Caraxes and Prince Aemon will return to the city with Daemon's head. Not all members of the Green Council favoured the prince's bold plan. Aemon had the support of Sir Criston Cole, the Hand, and that of Sir Tylan Lannister, but Grand Maester Orwell 
urged him to send word to Storm's End and add the power of House Baratheon to his own before proceeding, and Ironrod, Lord Jasper Wilde, declared he should summon Lord Hightower and Prince Daron from the south on the grounds that two dragons are better than one. The Dowager Queen Alicent favoured caution as well, urging her son to wait until his brother, the King, and his dragon Sunfire, the Golden, were healed so they might join the attack. But Prince Aemond had no taste for such delays. He had no need of his brother or their dragon, he declared. Aegon was too badly hurt, and Daron too young. Yes, Craxis was a fearsome beast, savage and cunning, and battle-tested, but Vagar was older, fiercer, and twice as large. Septon Eustace tells us that Aemon One-Eye was determined that this should be his victory. He had no wish to share the glory with his brothers, nor any other man. Nor could he be gainsaid, for until Aegon arose from his bed to take up his sword again, the regency and the rule were Aemon's. He was in effect king. The, true to his resolve, the prince rode forth from the gates of the god within a fortnight at the head of a host four thousand strong sixteen days march to harren hall he proclaimed on the seventeenth we will feast inside black harren's hall whilst my uncle's head looks down from my spear and across the realm obedient to his command jason lannister lord of castle rock poured down from the western hills descending with all his power upon the red folk and the heart of the riverlands the lords of the trident had no choice but to turn and meet him daemon targaryen was too old and a seasoned battler to sit idly by let himself be pinned inside the walls of harrenhal as big as they were the prince still had friends in king's landing and word of his nephew's plans had reached him even before Aemon had set out. When told that Aemon and Sir Kristen Cole had left King's Landing, it said that Prince Daemon laughed and said, past time, for he had long anticipated this moment. A murder of ravens took flight from the twisted towers of Harrenhal.